Ready for a spicy talk? <laughs> All right. Five years ago, Blender looked like this. And then overnight, it changed to this. With the release of 2.8, it improved upon many usability challenges. And all of these improvements made Blender more accessible to a wider audience, which attributed to the explosive growth that we saw through COVID and through today. So you might be wondering, why was this talk scheduled? <laughs> didn't we already solve this, right? And furthermore, Andrew, didn't you do a talk with this exact same title 11 years ago to the day? <laughs> right? So the answer is I've been talking to users. So at the start of this year, I announced I'm working on a Blender course. And to research for it, to find out more about users, I asked the community, you want to hop on a call with me? And I'll just ask you a series of questions. It's about an hour long. And I learned through that that the pain points that people had, a tutorial is not necessarily going to solve most of them because they were things like hitting the wrong key and your, half of your scene vanishing or getting stuck and taking, as one girl said, three days to resolve an issue that she couldn't figure out. And it was because something was checked, a box was checked, and she didn't know about it. This wouldn't help. And then also, further validating this, a couple of months ago, I put out a survey on Polygon. So it was to survey, although the eye of Sauron just walked in the room. Ton Rosendahl, everyone. <laughs> um, I put out a survey on, uh, on Polygon. Uh, just surveying the wider 3D community to find out, uh, you know, what does everyone think of different surveys? You select your survey and you fill in all the questions. And Blender crushed it. Blender did really well for every single category, was almost the leader. Except for one category, yeah. ease of learning. It's not the worst, it's not Houdini. <laughs> but it is worse than 3DS Max. <laughs> that hurts. And then the last question in the survey was just an open-ended, what could Blender do to improve? And these came up a lot. And this was actually surprising. I was like, oh, I thought we had improved it, but evidently there's some, there's some work to be done. So I did a lot of research, talking to a lot of users, and so I've identified what I think are the three weakest areas of Blender's usability. And uh, I'm going to be proposing a few solutions, some solutions you might not like, but it's mostly to get a discussion started, you know. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about uh, something that all of you can do if you want to take action to help um, with uh, the problems here. So let's start with viewport feedback. It's good user design to help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. And currently, Blender doesn't do a very good job of this. So I've got a Discord, and I was scrolling through it one day, and I noticed that about 50% of the questions that were coming through were related to just four issues with the viewport. Issues with non-standard scale, inverted normals, duplicated vertices, and overlapping faces. Something I'm sure everyone in here is familiar with. All related to the viewport. And I actually experienced this the other day. I was testing out some textures in Blender. Polygon textures, if you can believe it. I was just making sure that Polygon had the highest quality textures in the market. <laughs> and don't worry, they do. And then this happened. Look what's going on. You zoom in, and they just started to randomly pop in and out of existence. They're still there, but they're just popping in and out. And I'm like, so I'm like, maybe it's the clipping start distance. No, it's not that. Maybe it's the normals. No, they're all facing the correct way. It's not that. Maybe I've got to merge some vertices, that old trick. It's not that. I'm like, OK. Maybe it's the material. That's it. Maybe there's something wrong with the displacement. Maybe if I add a new material, maybe that'll fix it. Nope, it's not that either. I'm like, ah, try it all. Let's just restart Blender. Maybe that'll fix it. <laughs> and then I remember what happened. Earlier, they were out of alignment. So I selected everything, S, Y, Z. And although they're planes and although they're flat, it meant that the scale was 0. And Blender doesn't like that. <laughs> they should be one. So the solution to this problem was to apply scale. And then the problem resolved itself. Okay? So this took 15 minutes. I've been using Blender for 20 years. <laughs> you know? And on one hand, this is funny. It's relatable. right? We should sell t-shirts. When in doubt, <laughs> apply scale. 
But it's also frustrating, because you know who knew what the problem was the entire time? It was Blender, right? It knew enough to screw up the shading, but it didn't know enough to present that to me, the user, in a meaningful way that would help me diagnose this. So it was Blender's tossing out riddles. It's like, hmm, something's amiss. What could it be? And so then you as the user have to go through this pull from your memory of knowledge. Is it clipping start? No. Double normals, flip normals. And that's if you know these things, obviously. And then when you do find the solution, it doesn't make your scene better. It just means you can carry on with what you were doing previously. So here's a proposal. Hired a developer who might actually be in this room, Cody Winchester, to uh, mock up an idea. So this is an add-on for Blender. It doesn't work very well. It's just rushed before this presentation, but I'll show it. So um, what if Blender had a diagnostic shelf inside the viewport overlay? And then when you enable scaled objects, everything that has a non-standard scale is highlighted in red with a red outline. And then if you hover over it, it would tell you it's got a non-standard scale. That would solve that problem, maybe. Face orientation. Exactly the same as the current one we have, but it doesn't need the blue. We don't need to know when it's working correctly, only when it's wrong, and that way you can just leave it on and be alerted when it's wrong. Doubled vertices. I think it's stalled. <laughs> We've had an issue with the video. Could you uh, click just on the timeline a little bit? We'll see if we can... Uh, just go back a little bit. There we go. So we just highlight in red, little red dots, wherever there are doubled vertices. And it is surprising how often this happens. And then finally, overlapping faces for the same reason. Maybe you uh, extruded something, you escaped, and now you've got two faces there. And you don't realize, like, I had no idea there's double faces there, right? This is the scene that I was, I was making. So this is a proposal. It's an idea. It's not perfect. I mean, the colors conflict. I realize that now. It's all red. It's not helpful. But it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an idea. Um, and just for fun, I was testing out some other scenes that I was working on, um, and I was, oh, there we go. Yeah, I was surprised how often, like, half the objects in the scene had the wrong scale, right? And that was alarming to me because all these objects had, like, solidify modifiers or bevels where the scale actually makes an, imp uh, an impact on that. So I was like, all right, further maybe validates that this might be helpful. And if you spoke to a usability expert, they'd probably say, like, look, if this is important, why even just flag it? Why not solve it for the user? So we've already got auto merge vertices as a button. Why don't we have an auto recalculate normals and an auto apply scale? That way you just turn it on. And then every time you maybe enter into object mode, it just applies it. So I mean, originally this talk, I was going to be up here and like, let's, let's fix these things. And then I, I was talking to the UI team here. And it's like, turns out there is actually renewed interest in a lot of these interface usability challenges. So um, they actually were receptive. They thought this was interesting, interesting proposal. So I'm going to post it on right click select in about a week, and you can vote for it there. But anyways, next, shortcuts. Blender has a lot of shortcuts. Some would say too many. I would say too many. <laughs> Look, they're, they're great. Like, I use, that's the only way I work. Um, don't use tools, because it's so much faster to use shortcuts. But you think you know the shortcuts, and then you go to the shortcuts menu, and there's thousands of shortcuts. And don't use most of them. The problem with shortcuts is that we are human, and humans make mistakes. We hit the wrong key. Something, something happens. What happens? You don't know. You find out later. <laughs> so as an example, this was a scene I was working on for my course. And uh, here's some things that happened. Working on it accidentally instead of F1, hit one. Oh. <laughs> I got to cycle through the thing. God, right. And then I'm like, ah, oh, try to hit S to scale this. Accidentally hit W. Now my cursor is a circle. <laughs> right? Or uh, went to move part of a mesh accidentally instead of hitting G, hit H. Mass, everyone says this is uh, by far the worst. And then uh, instead of hitting control tab, how about shift tab? Now you've just turned on snapping. Don't realize it. Now you go to move something, and it's all jittering around, right? And depending on the snapping mode, it might be incremental, and it's not even moving, and you don't even know why. For somebody who doesn't know why, this could be very confusing to them. And then proportional editing. You don't realize the fall off area is so large that it's encapsulated in the whole mesh, and now the whole thing is moving. It doesn't make any sense. It confuses a lot of people. So I reached out on social media, asking people what are their most common um, shortcuts that they mix up. 
by far the biggest is H, hide. Um, obviously the isolate cool, uh, keys. So these are just the common ones. Now, what to do about this? A few solutions. One, you could remove them. It, it, depending on the shortcut, it probably makes sense. Like I think the, the number keys, you could make a pretty solid argument that that's legacy old thing that doesn't make any sense anymore with collections. Maybe W. Um, another one is obscure it. So H, hiding something, it's a very useful function. We don't want to get rid of that. But it's too accessible. You hit it so many times accidentally. What about shift H? It's a possibility. And then finally, improving the feedback, which is something that would probably benefit all of them, regardless of just these specific shortcuts, but Blender as a whole. So as an example, um, another mock-up. What if Blender had a little info box at the bottom of the screen there to show you what action you've just performed and what keys you've just pressed? Because so many times you go to hit you know, Shift U and you hit Shift I, and it's like, did Shift I do something? Did it? I don't know. I'll, have to, I'll find out later, I suppose. You know. It would be great if there was some way you could see to show a clear listing of what was just actioned. We do have an info box, but it's like a Python script log. Um, it's not really in like readable format. Um, so you know, it's just an idea. And also, a, a spicy idea, throw it out there. I actually think this would make a better default view. If this worked, then the timeline, hear me out, not everybody is doing animation. But at least everybody in layout needs to build stuff, and they need to know what they're doing. So this would probably be more useful to more users than timeline, maybe. I don't know, throwing it out there. I was talking to Harley before, and he's like, no, 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 get, get, get controversial. Let's hear some crazy ideas. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, status flagging. So this happened to me the other day. I was working on this thing. Hmm? Yep. And I went to rotate this stool. I couldn't rotate it. I was like, mm, it's not rotating at all. And I was like, oh. I couldn't scale it either. Hit S, couldn't scale it. I could move it. I couldn't rotate, couldn't scale it. And I was like, I know what it is. It's locked. It's not locked. Oh, OK. Maybe it's a constraint. It's not a constraint. Maybe it's a modifier. Does anyone know what it is? Call it out if you know. What? I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> I actually had to ask ChatGPT. He told me, affect only locations. It's a great feature, but it doesn't work on one object. It's confusing. Um, and actually, it, the, uh, the mystery was solved, because I don't really use that feature. Um, and I was like, how on earth did I check that box by mistake? It's not, you, actually, if you just hold period key, it brings up the pie menu. And then if you just accidentally flick to the top right, it'll just turn it on. And you doesn't even have to like, appear fully. You just like barely tap it and just like flick and it just turns on and it's like, that's what happened. So it's a partly a shortcut issue. But coming back to this problem, right? In this moment when I hit R and it was in the rotate state, Blender could have done anything to state that at least it's unusual that you would try to rotate in this and it's not going to work, right? But instead there was this guessing game that uh, we had to do. So as a general usability principle, you don't want to require people to remember a system status or what they've done previously. Because um, even what did you do on that object you know, an hour ago, let alone what you did the day before, or a colleague's file when you open up their file, whatever crazy setup they've got, you're not going to know. So the software needs to help you uh, see that. So Blender actually does this. Um, when you ever go to unwrap something, it's not, um, there's no seams. It'll give you a little flag. Very useful. I love this. Um, only problem is, is it's out of the way. It's way down there. Miss it half the time. So uh, another little mock-up. There's actually a few things going on here, but this is just some ideas. Um, what if, to show you that something unusual, something non-default as a non-default behavior, what if instead of a white outline, the color changed? I don't know, blue, something like that. And then in the info box, going back to the info box, if this thing works, um, it could be the same color, and then it could just be like a text box that's showing you anything. Could be a constraint, could be something that's locked, could be something to do, yeah. All sorts of stuff um, as an idea. Also, Pablo suggested this. We could relocate the rotation angle instead of the top left-hand corner where you always miss it. Put it down near cursor, and then instead of all those uh, hotkeys along the bottom, it could just be in the sidebar. So that's kind of the pitch, the proposal. And some of you watching will be like, 
Come on. <laughs> Saving a minute here. Oh, come on. Uh. <laughs> oh, <it's my> power, <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, like, yeah, it's like it's a minute here and it's a minute there. And, yeah, some people like solving Sudoku puzzles, you know. But the trouble is Blender's scale, right? Blender has a lot of users. So uh, Ton estimated there's 2.5 million users. I actually think it's more than that. But let's say it's 2.5. And, like, and like, I normally am spending, like, at least an hour, maybe two resolving issues per week, right, related to the usability, different states, different hotkeys. But let's say it's only 30 minutes for the average user. And then let's say instead of the whole year, it's only half the year that they're using Blender. That's 32 million hours, or 3,700 years every year, which is, by the way, enough to build one and a half Burj Khalifas in human productivity. And since we're using a computer, the CO2, 354 cars driving for one year. I thought maybe with this slide, I could appeal to like the capitalists and the environmentalists. <laughs> like, So it's a problem worth solving. And also, it's in Blender's interest, because everybody who tries Blender doesn't end up succeeding. Put your hands up if you know someone, a niece, a cousin who tried Blender, couldn't stick with it, just couldn't get the hang of it. Steep learning curve, right? Most of us know someone. They want to, but they just couldn't. And so usability, obviously, any usability, they say as a, uh, an estimate in the software world that any $1 spent on usability has a 100x return. Um, it's, it's a great return on investment. So in Blender's case, if we could flip that around, any usability improvement, and succeed the number of people that try it, obviously that's going to relate to the donations that Blender receives, and that's just going to be um, a snowball effect that just grows and grows, and we can get more features, improve the simulation tools, all the fun stuff that we need. <laughs> so taking action. Does everyone agree it's like important? I don't know. Yeah? All right, all right, OK. It's not controversial. Cool. Um, here's the thing, we're not going to solve this in a 20-minute talk, right? There's, there's so much work here, um, and there's so much that isn't, this is the, the UI uh, board, where there's other outstanding issues, there's uh, the whole shortcut customization thing, there's hundreds of consistency flaws, there's tooltip improvements, UI guidelines, standards, all stuff that we need, um, and it's just, it's, it's a people and money problem. So I was talking to Pablo and um, Julian yesterday about uh, what, what could I suggest at the end of this talk to take action from the audience. So they requested, if you are a UI or UX designer or a product manager, please go to this link. Um, they need people who can do design mockups. Like, ideas are kind of worthless unless you can show them. Like, it's a starting point then, but just going like, hey, we should improve. We should simplify the, the layout. It's like, yeah, how? Um, they also need people to write human interface guideline documentation. They need product managers. The thing is, Blender's a great place to work, from what I can tell. <laughs> and if, you can, if you're a student, you're studying UI, you're studying UX, um, if you can show some ideas, show that you you've, uh, are active in the community, when they do have an opportunity or they need somebody, um, you're much more likely to be reached out to. So it's a, it's a great way to, to enter the industry. Um, so that's that. And then everybody else, please go here. And that, <laughs> I'll let it sink in. Wait for you all to load it on your phone. Ha, gotcha. It's the Dev Fund page. Because <laughs> it's a money problem. It's a money pro It's a people and it's a money problem. There is so much. It blend it's, it's insane, actually, how complex it is and how much is accomplished with so few resources. And there's just too much. I mean, it's, it's not like these problems aren't known. <laughs> Everybody knows a lot of them exist, but it's, they need more money. So uh, please be one of the few that donates. Put your hand up if you donate to the Dev Fund. All right. Put your hand up if you don't donate to the Dev Fund. I'm not going to shame you. All right, everyone remember their faces. <laughs> We're going to bring back some old school bullying. No one sit with them at lunch. All right. Um, and that was it. Thank you.
And before you go, before you go, I just want to take a quick selfie. All right, smile. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all.